Hi, I'm Phonix, the 525 flight surgeon. Like you, I've been hearing a lot about coronavirus in the news over the last few weeks. Some of you may be wondering what the big deal is. Others might be feeling concerned for yourselves or your loved ones. Sometimes the worst thing about a situation like this is the number of unknowns it brings into our lives that we have to deal with or explain to our kids. The purpose of this briefing is to teach to remove as many of the unknowns as possible so that you really understand what the virus is, how it spreads, why some people are very concerned about it, and most importantly, so that you understand what you can do to minimize the impact of this infection on your life and on the lives of the people you care about. So let's get into it. The coronavirus is a type of virus, and I want to start by giving you a better sense of scale. So let's look at this enlarged image of a ruler and suppose that we could expand a single millimeter to fill the entire slide. Well, if we could do that, just one skin cell would take up about 3% of the length of the slide, or be about 20 to 30 micrometers. Now, if we expand the image of the skin cell, we can appreciate how small a bacteria is by comparison. It's about one micrometer in diameter. A virus is still much smaller than that. Let's enhance the image a couple times, and you can begin to appreciate that the virus is just about a tenth of the diameter of the bacterium or about 120 nanometers. For comparison's sake, red light has a wavelength of 700 nanometers. So we're talking about something that's quite small. If we expand the image from the electron microscope, you can see where coronavirus gets its name, from the corona or wreath of proteins that projects from it. These proteins allow the virus to infect healthy cells. Once inside a healthy cell, the virus uses the natural machinery inside the cell to replicate itself. It can then spread to other cells, worsening the infection. COVID-19 impacts healthy cells in the lungs, and so it has a ready route for transmission, because once it's replicated, all the infected person has to do is cough, and the virus can spread. COVID spreads primarily via respiratory droplets. I don't mean droplets you can see with your eye. These are microscopic droplets that can remain suspended in the air for a little while after somebody talks, breathes, or coughs. The droplets are about half the size of a skin cell, which is much larger than a bacteria, but still big enough for thousands of viruses to fit inside. We expel these droplets when we talk, cough, or sneeze. In fact, coughing once is worth about five minutes of conversation, and in one sneeze, the average person will expel about 40,000 respiratory droplets, which is enough for 80 minutes of conversation or enough time to watch the entirety of the Emperor's New Groove. And if somebody sneezes three times in a row, that's worth a debrief with punk if you're TDY. Transmission seems to occur most readily within a range of six feet. This is probably because the droplets can remain suspended in the air for long enough that folks who are inside of that metaphorical danger zone can inspire some of the droplets and acquire the infection. But there's another way for the virus to spread. How many of us have wiped our nose or rubbed an eye or touched our faces at least at some point today? Probably most of us. Well, the problem is sick people also touch their face. And all it takes is for one sick person to rub his or her eye and touch a door handle. And if you touch that same door handle on the way to the lunchroom, and take a bite of that sandwich before you wash your hands. You acquire the infection too. This is why it's so important to wash our hands frequently. And uh, let's talk about how bad the virus is right now. Well, if we look at average deaths per day, coronavirus isn't anywhere near the top. It's only causing about 70 deaths a day, which still puts it far behind seasonal flu or automobile accidents that are taking over 3,000 lives per day. Let's compare it to some other viruses. We've got the common cold and chickenpox with mortality rates far less than 0.01%, or measles, which is quite contagious, but kills less than 1% of people who acquire the infection. There are more deadly viruses like smallpox or Ebola with a 50% mortality rate or Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, which has a mortality rate of about 30%. For comparison's sake, both Middle East Respiratory Syndrome and SARS are coronaviruses, and they seem to have a much higher mortality than COVID. 
if we could put COVID somewhere on this chart, it would probably fit somewhere around here with an R0 value between 1.5 and 3.5 and, and a mortality between 0.7% and 4.5%. This means that the average person with COVID will spread it to between 1.5 and 3.5 and people and uh, the mortality rate we're not sure about yet but it's probably somewhere above 1%. If we could place the Spanish flu on this list, it would be somewhere similar with an R0 value around 1.5 and with a mortality somewhere in between 1 and 10%. Now, if we're just looking at this chart, it might look like uh, other viruses we've dealt with are bigger problems. It, for example, is very clear that SARS has a higher mortality rate, and it looks like it might be more contagious than COVID-19. So why are we so concerned? Well, this chart doesn't tell the whole story. SARS, for example, was more deadly, but it was also easier to detect. So we caught cases quickly and contained the outbreak, such that there were only about 6,000 cases worldwide and a few hundred deaths. Coronavirus is harder to track. Hard enough, in fact, that a doctor recently testified to Congress that he thinks somewhere in between 70 to 150 million Americans will contract the virus. That's somewhere in between 20 to 50 percent of our population. So let's do some napkin math and see if that's even possible. Now, if you had coronavirus and you were pretty careful about it, such that you only spread the virus to one person per week, and it took your body about two weeks to clear the virus, well, the number of infections in the country would still double every single week. We're at about 4,000 infections right now. And if we go back eight weeks to the start of the Chinese New Year, when many people were traveling back to the United States from mainland China, we can see that we would only need eight to 16 people to get into the country with COVID-19 and for the virus to spread to one person per week for us to be at 4,000 infections now. And if the virus kept growing at that rate, then in another 15 to 16 weeks, we could easily be at that 70 to 150 million number. Let's see if the actual numbers bear that out. If we assume that we didn't catch all the infections right away because we didn't have all the testing facilities up and we just start with these numbers, we can see if they fit a doubling pattern. Let's assume two here and we'll go four, eight, 16, 32, 64, and just look at how close these numbers are, 128. And then we can suppose that our testing started to catch up and we see a rate that looks faster than doubling as we track our infections. So it's possible that the infection would spread to this many people. Fortunately, the majority of infections are mild. About 5% of people require ICU level care and just over 10% require hospitalization. The majority of people who need this kind of care are folks who are at retirement age or older but it's important to note that people in their 40s and 50s have still had very severe cases. Of the average active duty population that's more in their 20s and 30s, the death rate is about one in 500. So our goal is to flatten the curve. Remember that about 5% need ICU level care. This is usually the case because if coronavirus attacks the lungs and triggers a massive inflammatory immune response, fluid can build up in the lungs, such that they can no longer exchange oxygen and CO2. If this happens, the necessary treatment is to place a breathing tube that can give positive pressure to the lungs and allow somebody to keep breathing. Well, how many ICU beds are in this country? About 100,000, and we can consider that maybe only 10 to 20,000 are free at any given time. I don't want to get into the math of what would happen if 70 million people got infected and 5% or 3.5 million people needed an ICU bed and we only had 10,000. So instead, let's look at some of the numbers for Anchorage. I did a Google search for all the hospitals in the city and added up all the beds that I could find advertised on the hospitals. And I'd estimate we've got somewhere in between 900 and 1,000 beds and somewhere in between 100 and 200 ICU beds in the city. So what happens if half the city gets sick? Well, we have 290,000 people. We'll round that up to 300,000 people in Anchorage. Half the population 
150,000. And if 10% of those 150,000 need hospital level care, that's 15,000 people, which far exceeds our 900 estimated beds. If 4.7% of people need ICU level care, that's so far above our 100 to 200 estimated ICU beds that we could be in real trouble. But what if that infection is spread out over the course of 10 weeks? Well, then things start to look a little more manageable. Then we would only have 15,000 people sick every week, and we'd be looking at about 1,500 people needing hospital beds, which is a little closer to our 900 number. We'd be dealing with 700 instead of 7,000 needing ICU level care, which is a little closer to our bed number of 1 to 200. But we can do a little better than that. Suppose we were effective at quarantining and limited our social contacts and spread this out over 20 weeks. Well, then that 700 number becomes 350. And if we really are effective at limiting social contacts and quarantine, it's reasonable to suppose that less people will get the infection in total. So maybe instead of 50% of the population, we limit things to 20 to 25%. And if we do that successfully, then we could get our number of people on average requiring ICU level care down to say 150 to 175, which is a little bit closer to the number of estimated ICU beds in the city. Now, there's a little more reason to be hopeful in Anchorage. Our mean age is just 34 years old. The majority of people around this age don't require hospital level care and Anchorage and Alaska as a whole are younger on average than the rest of the country. So we can expect that these 10% and 5% numbers of people who need hospital and critical care may be a little bit lower for us. Overall, our goal is to flatten the curve. You've probably heard about this on the news or social media. It's a simple way of saying if everybody gets sick at the same time, it's almost a certainty that hospital resources will be quickly overwhelmed. If this dotted line represents the ability of our hospitals to manage sick patients with COVID-19, then our goal is to slow the rate of infection such that even if the same number of people do get sick, we minimize the number who exceed our hospital's ability to treat them. Again, it's easy to imagine how if thousands more people needed an ICU bed or a breathing tube than we had available, the results would be catastrophic. But if we can slow the rate at which people become sick, even by a little bit, we can greatly minimize the number of deaths and serious harm that come from this illness. This is a picture taken in 1918 in the city of Philadelphia. They hosted a parade to boost morale in World War I, knowing full well that the Spanish flu was a serious threat. The city of St. Louis, in contrast, quarantined all its citizens. So you can imagine which city had a better time on the day of this picture. Unfortunately, history bore out that the officials in St. Louis made a much better decision. This graph represents the death rate per 100,000 citizens in the months following the parade. Now, if this area under the curve is equal between St. Louis and Philadelphia, the difference in deaths between these two cities is represented by the difference in area between these two shapes, with this shape being St. Louis and this one being Philadelphia. You can see that quarantining the citizens saved thousands of lives. So what should you do? Well, Keep your hands to yourself and don't touch your face. Wash your hands every time you use the bathroom or before you eat. If you have to cough or sneeze, do so into your sleeve and stay home if you feel sick. For most people, going to the hospital, uh, even if you feel sick, uh, would only present the opportunity to spread coronavirus to somebody else if you had it or to acquire it yourself if you were healthy. Limit going to the gym Consider changing how you participate in your faith tradition and limit school activities, going to sporting events, bars, or concerts. You'll also hear about the concept of social distancing on the news. This just means giving everyone those six feet of space that you would give somebody who had the virus, even if you don't think they're infected. Say you're at the grocery store, and instead of lining up right behind the person in front of you, you give them six feet of space. Well, even if that person has the virus and starts coughing, 
If you've given them a little bit of room, there's a very good chance you will not acquire the infection. So in summary, coronavirus is a contagion. It poses a bigger threat to the elderly and to people who already have serious illnesses. When the virus first broke out, we thought that it would pose a serious risk to children. Fortunately, statistics have borne out that the vast majority of kids recover with no complications. The second, you can start preventing the spread of this virus today. If you're watching this video, all you need to do are make simple behavior changes and you can really reduce the impact of this virus on your entire community. Focus on washing your hands, on uh, social distancing from other people, and on coughing into your sleeve. The majority of the changes that we're imposing, especially quarantines and travel restrictions, will seem excessive if they're successful. Keep in mind how much we've talked about flattening the curve. Well, if infections spread rapidly and we greatly exceed our medical system's capabilities to take care of patients, it'll make the news. There will be a lot of deaths and a lot of suffering thanks to the virus. But if quarantine and other social distancing measures are effective, such that we never exceed our hospital's capability to take care of patients, ideally, this will blow over in a few months, and it might feel like we've made a big deal uh, out of something that wasn't that big of a problem. But the reality will be that by slowing the rate of infection, uh, we've made a major change and saved lives. Um, thanks for watching this presentation. If you have questions about this, please reach out to your primary care doctor and ask about what you can do. Thanks for your time.